Good. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dave Winkler. Dave and I have been friends and shipmates for uh, some 30 years. Uh, Dave uh, was in the Navy for 38 years, both in active and reserve duty as a surface warfare officer. Uh, he's an outstanding historian, and he was when I first met him a long time ago, but he's gotten better uh, from year to year. Right now, uh, he's an adjunct professor with the Naval War College at the Navy Yard uh, here in DC. Dave holds a PhD in history from American University. Among other things, uh, he was the senior staff historian with the Naval Historical Foundation and the Charles Lindbergh Chair of Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. He currently compiles uh, as Heather said, uh, Tuesday Tidings for us here at the National Maritime Historical Society. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you ought to take a look at it. Uh, it uh, tells just about everything that's going on in uh, Navy history from week to week. Dave is also assistant historian for the Naval Order of the United States. A prolific writer, Dave has authored or co-authored four major military history books, and hundreds of short naval uh, history articles, including a monthly column in the Navy League's journal, uh, Sea Power. Dave received the NMHS Distinguished Service Award two years ago in uh, 1920, or 2022, rather, for his work promoting the importance of America's naval history and for all that he's done with maritime heritage organizations. In particular, he's done outstanding work as program manager for the National Maritime Alliance conferences. Uh, so finally, Dave knows, Dave knows about as much as anyone for the Navy's first aircraft carrier, the USS Langley. So Dave, the floor is yours to tell us about the importance of the Langley and more broadly how aircraft carriers revolutionized naval warfare. Over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, well, you know, I was just thinking it's this is almost like our 25th anniversary because you and I deployed to the USS Enterprise uh, to document uh, Operation Desert Fox, which occurred in December of '98. We were in the Persian Gulf in uh, March, April of uh, uh, 1999. So you know, I don't know. Maybe that was the, the spark the impetus on uh, my interest in aircraft carriers because that was the first time I had ever been on. Aircraft carrier, so uh, and to be on, uh, you know, that you know, historic ship, and and then to find out that nobody has ever written a book on Langley, so uh, that was an opportunity, and you know, I took advantage of it. So uh, let me pull up the slides here. This should, uh, okay, there we go. There we go. So, uh, okay. Uh, so I'm assuming everybody, uh, thumbs up, everybody can see the, uh, the cover of the book. Uh, and let's, let's move on. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, today's talk, I'm not really gonna focus on the history of the ship. Uh, that's why I'm thinking I wrote the book. You can, you can buy, or you, you can get the cliff notes on Wikipedia. Uh, what I want to do today, tonight, is is focus on some of the people who uh, served on the uh, Langley, uh, you know, and, and kind of share some of their stories. Uh, with some very uh, unique individuals. Uh, I also want to uh, mention that uh, you know I published another book last month, Witness Neptune's Inferno. And I, I kind of feel like I, I don't want to shortchange that book. So uh, there, there's going to be an opportunity to do a crossover sometime during this uh, presentation so that uh, I can do a plug for uh, the, the witness book. So anyway, uh, let me introduce you to the cast of characters I'm going to uh, uh, talk about this evening. Uh, we got Rufus uh, F. Zogbaum Jr. It's a, a classic uh, 1901, and, um, you know, Kipling wrote about uh, uh, his father in a memoriam to uh, Roby, Ebb, uh, Roby D. Evans, uh, 
noted admiral who, who uh, uh, at the turn of the century, and, he's, and his augmented drawers with a pencil, as I did with a pen, he sit up in the conning tower, possibly 800 men. Zogman takes care of his business, take care of mine. And if you take her 10,000 tons, I should include a bride. Zogman can handle the shadows, I think, my style. You can handle a 10 inch gun, carry seven miles. To him, half shall be given. That's why these books are sent to a man who has lived more stories, Zogman and I could invent. So, you know, uh, Kipling's writing about the, uh, you know, uh, Zog bomb, this guy's uh, father. And so, uh, who is Bruce, this Zog bomb senior? Well, he's probably one of the most uh, noted naval artists of the uh, 19th century. Here's some of his works, some of you are familiar with. Consequently, uh, his son, Junior, who uh, goes to the Naval Academy, uh, his lucky bag says that uh, naturally he's got artistic temperaments. All right. Now, uh, another character who, who, who's I'm not going to feature tonight, but uh, is going to be associated with uh, my only is, uh, is Zogmon's classmate, Ernest uh, King. And the same uh, uh, contrast, Ernest King in the, in the Lucky Bag noted, temper, don't fool with nitric blessing. So, uh, Zogmon, claim to fame. Why am I introducing him first? Well, see that airplane there? Zogmon's not flying. The, the reason why this is a, a significant is that Eugene Eli landing on the, the uh, deck of the uh, armor protected cruiser USS Pennsylvania. And the reason Zogmar's role in, in this, he was the deck uh, officer who built that uh, plot. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, as they were talking about this landing beforehand, Zogmar, you know, approached Eli and says, okay, so what's going to stop you from hitting that mass back? And they thought about that, and that's where they came up with these, putting these two two by sixes down with sandbags with, with uh, lines stretched across, you know, uh, so that the aircraft could make a trap. And it's, it's essentially the concept that we use today in aircraft pair. So, uh, you know, trapping aircraft on a flight deck of an aircraft pair. Uh, so we're going to continue uh, Zogmom's story later in uh, the, the program. Then there's John Henry Towers, a uh, class of uh, 1906, and he gets interested in naval aviation. Qualifies as a pilot uh, and uh, eventually is uh, going to be designated naval aviator. And he's going to be the integral. Uh, uh, he'll be Navy number three, okay? He's going to be... Integral and sent off the first naval air station at Greenberg Point across the Naval Academy. And eventually he's going to uh, fly down, uh, uh, be transferred down to Pensacola. And there's going to be a reason why Pensacola is going to be called the Cradle of the Aviation. So he, he's the guy actually uh, invents, inventor of the uh, uh, Wings of Gold, uh, that, you know, that, that uh, breast insignia that you see on uh, naval aviators nowadays. Uh, later, 1919, he is going to be the uh, pilot of uh, NC-3. There's going to be three aircraft that try to make it across the Atlantic Ocean. NC-4 does make it. Uh, NC-3 uh, basically makes it to, to the uh, towards the Azores and has to be towed into the So, uh, uh, a, you know, good effort on his part. We'll we'll continue his story. He, he's going to be a prominent character in this uh, story here. Uh, Henry C. Mustin. Uh, he is a uh, class of uh, 96. He, he's from Philadelphia. He grows up, uh, joins the you know, Naval Academy, plays football. Uh, he's a, a Spanish American War. He actually is involved in the, uh, main, the main investigation. Then he gets uh, sent to the Philippines, uh, does some uh, heroic stuff there. He's into gunnery. He, uh, he packs a lot of, uh, you know, sighting uh, uh, devices, uh, you know, sight guns, uh, optics. Uh, and then uh, he, he marries uh, Corrine, and uh, they have a friend in Philadelphia, and they, they get taken on a ride on an airplane, and he, he, he sees the future, and he treat, uh, changes the naval aviation. Uh, his claim to fame is he, he's uh, piloting the first catapult shot on the uh, 5th of November, 1915, off the North Carolina, which is down in Pensacola, and watching 
that it was his two young boys. Uh, there is uh, Lloyd, and then there is uh, Henry uh, Henry Amos. So they're, they're they're looking at dad taking off from North Carolina, uh, and this is where the crossover comes in because uh, Lloyd is uh, eventually goes to graduate in the Naval Academy class in 1932. Uh, he's going to be assigned as the uh, assistant gun boss on the uh, anti-aircraft cruise of USS Atlanta, which is commissioned in December 1941. And he's going to uh, write this diary that I have in my hand right here about his experiences on the Atlanta, his observations of how the war is being run uh, until the, the Atlanta is lost in the naval battle of Guadalcanal. And uh, that's, uh, uh, I, I document all that, but just didn't have to use it. So, so there was your cross-up, plug for the other book. Anyway, uh, his father, Henry, uh, he gets in trouble with Washington. A couple of his aviators die uh, during training, and uh, he actually gets his wings pulled. So he's kind of a good uh, But uh, uh, Josephus Daniels, he gets into World War I, and, we're, and the German U-boats are just uh, creating problems for us. So he has this, I want a great idea how we can take out the German U-boats. And, and Mustard comes up with this idea, is what we'll do is we'll have these uh, sea sleds, these speed boats that can go up to 50 knots, and you take it, uh, a big airplane, and that will generate enough speed Get the uh, the bomber in the air so that we can get something within range of the Ger uh, German U boat bases. Um, it's it's a concept that is actually tested in 1919 after the war is over, and it, it proves it would have worked. It, it just wasn't available at the time, uh, uh, you know, before that war actually ended in 1918. But Mustin's now uh, back in. He's uh, he is now a leading figure in naval aviation, and he's going to come in. Uh, to our, our story. Then, then there's Kenneth Whiting, a class of uh, 1905. Whiting is, um, you know, he, he, he's not, uh, he's kind of slow in the uptake at the Naval Academy. He graduates something like uh, 107 out of 114, uh, but he's a, yeah, he is a late bloomer. Uh, he gets into submarines initially, and uh, he, here he's, uh, and he, and he, he, he has command of the Porpoise, uh, one of these early submarines that, that's going to be out in the Philippines in 1909. And one of his claims to fame is that he was always curious about, well, can you escape one of these things? So he actually, the, the, when the Porpoise is submerged about 20 uh, feet under, he climbs into the torpedo uh, to orders the torpedo to flooded, has the, open, the front hatch open, and he it swims out to the surface, demonstrating that it's possible to escape from a, a, you know, a submarine that's trapped in that, you know, at the bottom. So uh, that was, you know, so he, he, you know, that's one of his uh, things of fame. Um, he uh, is the last naval aviator to study under, uh, you know, Orville uh, Wright uh, uh, up at Dayton. Uh, he gets his uh, wings and he gets assigned down to Pensacola actually helps uh, set the place up as a training facility. Uh, he's uh, designated as Naval Pilot Number 16. Um, World War I, uh, he's the guy they, the, the Navy sends over on the uh, USS Neptune, a Collier, uh, and uh, in June of 1917, with uh, which is gonna be called the first Fort aeronautical detachment. And this is, the Navy's gonna be the first into, uh, France to, to set up bases so that we can send seaplanes out to try and hunt down German uh, U-boats. Um, so we'll get to uh, more on whiting uh, a little bit later. And then there's George W. Steele. I'm not going to talk too much about Steele. He's kind of a minor character, but plays a significant role, as you'll see. Class of 1900, he's not involved in aviation whatsoever. He uh, he, uh, in World War One, he's actually given command of a troop ship. And it's towards the end of the war, uh, he, they pick up, you know, he's a senior officer, he's, like, he's a captain, to uh, be in charge of aircraft squadrons that land. He has no flight, flight experience, but they need somebody who's a senior level officer to be in charge. 
So they they have charge of uh, all the airplanes assigned to the Atlantic uh, fleet. So he'll he'll be uh, we'll, we'll uh, he'll come in later. Uh, and then there's Joseph Mason Reeves, uh, class of uh, 1894. During his time at the Naval Academy, he liked to play football. Okay, that was in fact. And later, he he's actually going to be a, a coach at the Naval Naval Academy. Coach football team for a few years. His claim to fame, he's the inventor of the football helmet. Okay. Uh, he got cussed so many times at the Naval Academy that, you know, the doctor said, we, We're not going to let you back out there on the field. You, you're going to do some permanent da damage to the young man. So, what he started, he, he built a, this uh, pad, thick leather padding, and hence you have the origins of the football helmet that you have today. So, he is going to go on, uh, and uh, he is going to be the first commander of the Collier Jupiter. Okay, and that ship's going to, you know, come into play, uh, uh, as you'll see. Um, and, and what's unique about the Jupiter is, uh, is that it's got a um, electro uh, thermal drive uh, propulsion plant, uh, unlike uh, you know the other propulsion plants of the day. So. Uh, it's it's got two screws can get can get up to sixteen knots and that's gonna, that, that's going to be a factor uh, later on. So he's you know, in command of this Collier man, which they uh, Jupiter's commissioned in uh, nineteen thirteen. Hey, we'll get back to uh, then. Uh, you know, I had a couple of questions about the uh, Yale, uh, and there's you know, and I don't know the Mark Workman. Uh, Mark and I, we've gone back and forth. He wrote this you know, pretty good book, The uh, Millionaire uh, Unit, uh, the, you know, the aristocratic flyboys who fought in the Great War, who invented American air power. Well, that may be a little hyperbole there, but uh, uh, these these guys, uh, they actually uh, formed a, uh, a unit, uh, actually purchased the aircraft and uh, got themselves trained and then volunteered their service to the Navy in Naples. He, he's over in France, and he has the opportunity in late 1977, 18, to, to fly with the Royal, the newly formed the Royal Air Force, and he's going to get credit for uh, shooting down uh, five German aircraft, and he's going to be our first ace. So, uh, yeah, he is, uh, and he's going to be coming in uh, our story a little later. So, we're going to go to Act One of our narrative with these characters I just introduced. And uh, we're now at the Naval General Board here. It's spring of 1919. We're at the uh, main Navy building here. Uh, 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 I think this is Independence. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very close to where the uh, Vietnam Memorial is, is today. So they're having here is the General Board is an organization that was formed in 1900. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a reflecting think tank for the Navy. You, know, you bring up uh, proposals, ideas, and they ponder and, and they make recommendations. Uh, and the head of the board, you know, the General Board for the longest time was George Dewey, you know, the hero of uh, Manila. Um, and uh, incidentally, where I worked in the Naval uh, Historical Foundation, his desk was actually in our office, uh, you know, as head of the Navy Journal. So we had the Dewey desk there. Uh, now it's a store in some place. Uh, his, um, uh, you know, he, he, well, he passed away, I think it was 1917. You know, a book on Dewey just came out uh, by David Smith. Uh, uh, did a great job on that. And uh, uh, Rear Admiral Charles Badger took his, his spot as the head of the board. And as far as aviation was concerned, uh, Rear Admiral Albert G. Winterhalter uh, took the lead on that. Uh, uh, Halter was more scientific. Unfortunately, while he was at the Naval Academy, he uh, had an archery accident that kind of helped him, you know, hindered his vision. So he went into, uh, he was like the hydrographer hydro of the Navy. Uh, so he, he, he was the lead on looking into, you know, with the future of Naval aviation. And uh, there was hearings a year before. Uh, there was a lot of support for aircraft carriers because the British were building aircraft carriers uh, and deploying them. So, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, John Towers uh, recommended that the, the Navy convert a, a cruise liner for an aircraft pair. The British had done so. Uh, the board actually favored uh, building six aircraft pairs to keep them up um, over six years. But the uh, the CNO at the time, uh, Benson, he, he he said, you know, if I can't get this into the war right now, I don't want it. So let's, I want to spend money on things we can use against the Germans tomorrow. So the uh, idea of uh, aircraft carriers got panned. Of course, you know, the war is over on uh, the 11th of uh, November, uh, 1918. But the, the idea of aircraft carriers is uh, being explored. And uh, Whiting uh, appears before the board, and he says, you know, I went on board this uh, Collier, and that ship, boy, you empty those uh, holes, and there's lots of room for aircraft, you know, minimal crew uh, as far as operating the ship. Why don't we convert the Neptune? And Towers is interesting. He's actually uh, favoring money to spend in rigid airships, uh, but you know, he does support the uh, Collier conversion. Um, there is uh, Clayton Simmers is the constructor of the Navy. He's uh, with the uh, Bureau of uh, Yards and Construction, and he actually looks at the uh, Jupiter and says, hey, you know, this has got two screws. It's a faster ship. Neptune can only do 13. Jupiter can do 60. Why don't you convert the, uh, the Jupiter? So they're all set to uh, vote. Let's, let's do it. Except, yeah, uh, George Steele writes this letter from the fleet saying, I'm, I'm, I'm really opposed to this idea of converting a ship to uh, for, as an experimental aircraft carrier. And he says, you can go ahead and fund the design of it, but I don't build it. And, you know, what? The, the, there's some opposition. Benson is still against the idea of an aircraft carrier. So the general board wants to have a strong consensus. So they call uh, Steele uh, up from the fleet to uh, the, uh, the hearings in Washington and basically made it 12. It's kind of like his day of reckoning. So he appears before the board and, and uh, uh, folks like Mustard and Whiting are in the audience. And they said, okay, why do you, why, why are you going to be the long pole of the tent? And Steele says, he, he shares his visit that what we need is seaplanes. A seaplane is the destiny of the Navy. It, it, what you do is you, once you get a successful design, what you do is you upscale that design and you build a bigger seaplane. And then once you get that design in place and, and it works, then you upscale that design and you get an even bigger seaplane. Well, this is where uh, Henry Mustin comes in and it kind of like, uh, uh, you know, pops his balloon by saying, you know, seaplanes, you know, great. But it's really a fair weather proposition. Uh, once you get to rough seas, you know, your airfield is gone. And oh, by the way, uh, one of the things, reasons why the British decided to build aircraft carriers is because seaplanes, the reason why the British uh, uh, wanted the aircraft carriers was to actually shoot down German Zeppelins. And seaplanes just weren't uh, able to get up to the altitude that the Zeppelins were. Aircraft launched off of aircraft carriers could and actually succeed in shoot down some Zeppelin. So Mustin is is the voice of reason. He's able to convince uh, Steele, yeah, okay, I can see the utility of having an experiment with aircraft carrier. So the consensus is uh, reached and, uh, it, you know, the, the proposal for an aircraft carrier, it, it's a... Uh, is approved and uh, we're going to transition here to act two they got the jupiter and now you know this is like one of those uh, uh gilbert erection the rector sets uh, that you had as a uh, many years ago here's uh the jupiter being converted into the langley at the norfolk navy yard uh probably 19 uh 20 21 uh, time frame they built a flight deck on it uh, that Clayton Simmers is, a, is the constructor who's kind of overseeing it, but he's working closely with Kenneth Whiting, because uh, Whiting is uh, you know, one of the more you know, experienced aviators, and he, he's got an idea of what he wants, okay? And he's actually going to be the commissioning C, uh, CEO of the ship on the March of 20th. In fact, yeah, yesterday was the, uh, uh, yeah, 102nd birthday, okay? Happy uh, birthday, uh, Langley. Uh, here's the thing is, Langley 
really wasn't uh, ready for commissioning on March 20th, uh, it was still way short. They just ran out of money. Okay, so what they did is because uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, funds from the yards and uh, you know, yards of construction ran out, they commissioned the ship so they could tap funds from the operational uh, forces budget so they could finish the ship. And then the, the ship basically was finished uh, you know, late August, September of uh, 1922 and uh, actually gets underway. And here you can see uh, the first landing on uh, 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 October the 26th by Lieutenant Commander uh, Chevalier. Um, sadly, uh, he's going to die in, in, in an accident like two weeks later. And he, he's in a flight. His plane ran out of control. It, it, it crashes. Uh, now, um, on the 17th, uh, somebody uh, you know, wrote in and asked about uh, uh, Virgil uh, Griffin, who was the uh, first pilot to take off from the uh, uh, Langley. And uh, it's Wash Griffin uh, from Alabama. Uh, and uh, he's going to later become the executive officer in the 1930s. And he's going to, instead of being known as Squash Griffin, he's going to be known as Wall Griffin because uh, he's going to have a re reputation of saying uh, to the crew, hey, you all need to do this, you all need to do that. And uh, he also was not very popular because if you, you wore your Dixon cover wrong, he would come up from behind you, grab it, throw it over the side. And uh, there was an incident uh, that uh, he threw one enlisted sailor's uh, uh, Dixie cup over the side, and that, that sailor grabbed his, you know, cover and threw it over the side. So uh, uh, the crew got a kick out of that. Okay, Langley, uh, that first uh, winter is down in Pensacola, take advantage of the good weather. And in 1923, the ship is going to uh, go up the East Coast, uh, visit Washington, go up to Boston. Uh, in the meantime, Whiting is now the executive officer. Uh, uh, he, um, is and it's kind of interesting. He is involved in like the landings, and he's standing on the deck. Well, that could be him standing on the deck. Uh, uh, and he, 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 as planes are coming, he's kind of like waving his cap and saying, "Come over." This is where the uh, idea of a landing signal officer really generates. Um, the, uh, that hey, you know, it's it's good to have some guidance, and eventually you're going to have a guy that flags. Uh, you know, uh, bringing it down. Uh, because he's spending so much time, they had this pigeon house, okay? He, the, you know, the concept was is that they didn't have radios in, uh, small enough to carry on board the aircraft at the time, so that if they sp spotted the enemy battle fleet, that's what the concept was, that the airplanes would take off, find the enemy battle fleet, and then direct our battle fleet to the gauge. You know, you would have a pigeon on um, with your airplane, you release the pigeon, the pigeon would fly back to the Langley with a message saying the, bat, the enemy battle fleet is at this location. Um, this this concept worked very well when you know Langley was in Norfolk. They would send the pigeons all over the East Coast. They'd all fly back to the Langley. Uh, when they decided to release the pigeons at sea, that was a problem because they all flew back to Norfolk. So uh, they decided to convert the pigeon house to the new exos. Right, so that's uh, and it's almost like you know over there you can see uh, uh, that looks like Whiting there. Um, Whiting is going to uh, depart the ship before the ship uh, transits uh, to the West Coast in November of 1924. Um, the first CEO of the ship is uh, Spiffy Doyle, who is a surface guy, no aviation experience whatsoever. Uh, he's relieved by Edward the Ball, Sharpless Jackson. There's a name. Now, make things worse uh, at the Naval Academy. He was known as uh, his, his nickname was known as the uh, Hatchet Face. Okay, so there's a picture of yeah, uh, Edward the Ball, Hatchet Face uh, there, and uh, uh, and take a look at this headline. Every ship afloat lives. Um, you know, it, it, it's just an experimental aircraft carrying. It carries maybe about four or six airplanes, and, and they're just 
you know, there to test the landing gear, but uh, it's, you know, San Diego Union has been kind of being a precedent there as far as, you know, what the potential is. So this is where we get into Act 2 of our story. And, okay. Yeah, now uh, John Tower is in, uh, arrives in January 1926, uh, and he finds himself, you know, sleeping in this uh, pigeon coop, uh, and he's like, "This is like two stupid ideas. One, who would, you know, the whole idea of having pigeons on board a ship that was kind of stupid. And then, whose idea was it to have, have the exos border in the pigeon coop? But the reason why he's forced to sleep back there is because uh, Captain Joseph Mason Reeves uh, had already arrived as the commander at Air Squadron Battle." Uh, as, as the Pacific Fleet was kind of known back then in October of 1925, and he makes the Langley his flagship. Okay, so you know the good sleeping quarters that the XO normally would be up front, uh, him and his staff are grand. So uh, um, when Reeves arrives there, uh, he the first thing he he does, um, uh, and of course Reeves is familiar with the ship. This is the Jupiter, so. Uh, it's got some familiarity, but he gets all the aviators together. And he gives us 1,001 questions. Uh, and it's uh, basically he's going to challenge the aviators saying that, hey, uh, we're not going to, we need to find out what we can do because he, uh, as far as our capabilities, because he sees air power, he sees the potential of, uh, you know, being a striking armor to play, you know, not just to stout the battleship. But actually deliver coordinates on enemy uh, ships, and uh, but it's going to take a lot of work to do that. Okay, a lot of it means uh, you know for the U.S. Navy, it's getting planes into the air fast, being able to land aircraft fast. Because what you want to do is you want to uh, have mass attacks on enemy aircraft. So not just one plane at a time. The British would know. You know their practice is is to take an airplane, take it up to the flight deck, take off, take the plane up. In the U.S. Navy, it's going to be a flight deck load of airplanes. And they all go racing on. Uh, and in fact, you know, that's kind of what uh, Jim Newton and myself saw with the animals. Okay. Uh, again, like four cats going simultaneously. Uh, Towers had been uh, promised to fleet up the van. He was kind of disappointed when he heard that uh, uh, that wasn't going to quite happen yet. Uh, there was a Captain Frank Perry. Who took command uh, in June of 26? Uh, but, yeah, but eventually, uh, Towers will get the command of the ship in 27. In the meantime, there's a lot of friction between Towers really looking after the aviators. This guy, Reeves, really wants to push me out more. For example, on 9th of August, 1926, uh, Reeves says, How many traps can we uh, do on a day? Takes off the traps. And, and Langley reports 127. Many of them uh, were done by Gerald Bogan, who was a uh, pilot who's going to become a you know, well known in Admiral World War II. Uh, Bogan makes a majority of these traps. One of the planes uh, uh, breaks uh, lands, you know, breaks a landing gear and goes over the side. And, you know, they uh, throw a line over. He, he grabs the plane, goes underwater, but he's, uh, he's recovered. And he, you know, gets in the next airplane and takes off. And this is something going through the, the archives, uh, you know, the deck logs. Nobody, you know, I had, it was kind of wild to discover that nobody had really got, got to the deck logs in like years. And I just see plane bridge after plane bridge after plane bridge. Pilot gets out, uh, you know, foot, bruised nose, bruised hand, gets into the next airplane, takes off, gets into the next airplane, takes off. These guys will be destructive. Okay. Very, uh, plane goes on the side. You know, pilot gets fished out of water, takes plane, takes off. Um, you know, the hey, Langley's began to strut its cell uh, stuff. The Fleet Prom 7 at the uh, uh, end of the year, and Langley's uh, credited with taking out the. Uh, uh, the series of locks uh, on the uh, western end of the Panama Canal. And then uh, in May of 27, uh, Langley uh, demonstrates an ability to do uh, support uh, amphibious landings against the uh, you know, state of Rhode Island. Uh, in the summer, 
Langley plays a key role in a search for airplanes that were lost in one of these okay races to why uh, you know, which plane's going to be the first to get to Hawaii to claim the prize? Not all planes made it. So, uh, uh, if Langley led the turn out to be a few search. Um, it's the September of that year before uh, Tower Six command uh, in January that uh, re redesignate Langley from an experimental aircraft there to an actual operational unit that's going to work with the fleet and uh you know perform a mission and he wants to push the envelope remember Langley's kind of designed to have you know, maybe 12 to 18 aircraft at most Reeves wants to mark 36 aircraft um there is a uh fire in, in, in December 18th 1927 that nearly got to the aviation fuel state and had it done so our our, our slideshow would have ended right here Fortunately, uh, there was one death. Uh, some quick thinking was they, they were able to put it up, and you know there was severe uh, buckling of the flight deck. Langley is going to be going to Mare Island for some uh, you know, for some work, and that work was kind of planned anyway because they uh, realized that the flight deck, with, you know, the increasing size of the aircraft, they wanted to extend the uh, deck further back aft. We were thinking about uh, extending it forward, but uh, you, you can see here that if this is the old bridge of the old um, Jupiter. That's basically, uh, you know, uh, what your new point was ahead. So they didn't want to you know, block uh, the vision of that portion. So uh, this is the thing is when Towers was up in Mare Island, they were supposed to put in uh, more quarters to support more pilots because Reeves wanted to really load the ship up and Towers kind of, they really didn't push that. So when the ship does uh, return to San Diego and Reeves sees that, you know, the additional quarters was not installed, uh, you know, Towers is kind of like said, well, you know, we don't have the quarters, so we can't put all these planes on the board. Um, this is, you know, Reeves basically says, no problem. Next thing you know, they, they have uh, all these uh, uh, you know, sailors from the airfield uh, come on trucks with loads of lumber and they actually install build these quarters there in place in San Diego so they can take on uh, the new aircraft. Uh, and then, you know, Tara says that, you know, we can't really spot all these aircraft and Reeves gets on the flight deck and says, oh, yes, you will. And he actually spots all these aircraft. So much so that they actually can load 42 aircraft on the flight deck uh, for the next fleet, fleet problem that's going to be happening in Hawaii. Okay, which uh, concludes with an actual morning attack. Uh, Langley is able to get off at four in the morning uh, within like 12 minutes of all of its aircraft. And, uh, you know, they, they catch a uh, uh, hiccup air, air base, uh, you know, by surprise. Okay, uh, kind of, uh, you know, preview what's going to happen, uh, uh, you know, 13 years later. So the good news for Towers is that the Lexington, which is just recently commissioned, arrives towards the end of this exercise. Reeves, they're you know, like, hey, I have a new Panzer flagship. And he, uh, he gets off and places his flag on the Lexington. And uh, now uh, you know, Langley's no, no longer needs to carry a So let's get to Act 3, our final act here. And yeah, Reeves is, is stays on for the final act. And, and Towers, uh, Will too. He's going to make full admiral to World War II, commanding naval air forces in the Pacific. Uh, Reeves is actually going to go on to become the uh, commander in chief of the U.S. fleet uh, uh, during the 1930s. Uh, of course, that was you know the title for commander in chief of the U.S. fleet was sink us, uh, and uh, that title gets uh, changed uh, uh, after Pearl Harbor. It's 1930, and now Rufus Sogwam, we introduced earlier uh, at the very beginning, is now the commanding officer. Uh, he's uh, late to come to naval aviation, but he actually gets his uh, pilot wings, uh, uh, kind of like as I think commander or captain. I think Jones didn't do so at the time. And he is, they're expecting a VIP, okay? It's November 1930. 
And that VIP is David Ingalls, okay? David S. Ingalls, after he left uh, the Navy, goes back to Yale. Now, he's got to be a med student. He actually graduates with a degree in English in 1920. He goes into politics and he is on the uh, in, in Ohio legislator. He gets appointed assistant secretary of the Navy for uh, aeronautics, aviation by uh, President Hoover. And what's kind of neat about this assistant uh, secretary of the Navy is that he actually flies his own airplane, souped up airplane, around the country to the uh, basement. He actually visited uh, San Diego in 1929, the year before uh, Zogmom arrives, and visits Langley for the first time. And at the end of his visit, he hops in an airplane and flies off the plane to uh, you know, get back to shore. So he's already uh, taken off. And what he wants to do now is uh, he uh, wants to uh, get qualified uh, with his traps. Uh, John Towers is uh, now with the uh, Nav Air staff in Washington. He flies out to San Diego with them, and he fly and he flies out to also this fellow Will Rogers, who uh, uh, Ingalls, uh, you know, is a good friend of. And Will Rogers wants to get out and check out what's happening on the lake. So here you can see there Ingalls uh, arriving in. in uh, you know, Naval Air, Air Station of San Diego, which is now you know, north, known as North Island. Uh, you can see uh, Reeves there. Uh, uh, you know, Will Rogers. And there's Will Rogers on the flight deck at a lengthy with some, some of the uh, sailors. So they have this, they, you know, they get underway. They're going to have this luncheon. And they, and, you know, Ingles, I want to, you know, uh, what do I need to do to trap me? So when you take off, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, as you approach, uh, you know, you listen to the, you look at the landing safety officer and you, you drop your hook and then you, you, know, you land on the deck and you, you, you get trapped. So it's like, God, this it. And it's like Will Rogers says, you know, I bet you you're going to forget your hook. Bet you you're going to forget. And he goes, I got this. So sure enough, you know, Langley gets underway and uh, Ingles takes off. And he makes circles around, and he's approaching, and he's looking at, and, and the landing safety officer is is touching the deck. And that's the signal that you need to drop your hook. And Ingalls is wondering what's he what, what's he trying to signal me. And then the signal officer waves him off. So he he do this three times, and Ingalls is frustrated. He doesn't realize that. He, and and you know, what the problem is, and finally there is this chief petty officer. Gets a big blackboard and scrawls on the blackboard the letters hook. Okay, Ingalls then realizes what he you know, the state makes a perfect landing. You know, it, it does a couple of uh, traps, gets his hot carrier fall, and says, "Hey, uh, uh, Will, why, why, why don't you come up with me and you, we can do this together?" So Will Rogers is there like, well, I'm not really too sure I want to do this, but ever since I wrote, wrote the story that I landed on the ship, uh, yeah, I'll do it. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of the end uh, of, uh, you know, this, this narrative as far as uh, uh, you know, three-act play. And there is an epilogue. I, I do want to mention that uh, uh, Zogbaum is going to leave, uh, you know, Langley and... Um, um, this is the USS Pittsburgh. It's a year later. If Langley's aircraft are going to do, you know, drop bombs, you know, it's kind of like what we call today a sink ass, okay? So you can see, it, what's kind of interesting about the, the Pittsburgh is that once upon a time, the Pittsburgh was the Pennsylvania, and they had to change the name to Pittsburgh and clear the name for the battleship Pennsylvania. That was on Pearl Harbor, December seven. So it's probably a uh, fortuitous that uh, Zogmon had, uh, you know, had left the ship because probably would have went watching his old ship get blown up. Um, George Steele, you know, after putting, uh, you know, trying to stop uh, aircraft carriers from coming in to service, uh, making it as a stand at the uh, general board. He winds up in command of the Saratoga in, in the early 1930s. 
but he's not there for long because he runs the ship of Grant. Okay, so that's kind of the end of George Steele's career. Uh, the guy who's going to relieve uh, George Steele, Rufus Zogba. Okay, now the irony is is that George Steele's vision about these seaplanes it comes to fruition with the uh, you know the Catalina. This is the seaplane that really uh, plays an important role to World War II. Especially, you know, during the Battle of Midway, it's at least is what, uh, you know, cites the, the Japanese fleet, uh, you know, late on, I guess, June the 3rd. So uh, the problem is that Catalina is such a big uh, aircraft that it needs a bigger ship to tend to it. And the ship that they choose to be the seaplane tender for the Catalinas is the Langley. Okay, Langley has its flight, forward flight deck yanked off in 1937. And it's uh, going to be servicing these Catalinas uh, in, in uh, 1939. Ship is going to be in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and when the Germans attack Poland, uh, there's a realization that the Europeans are not going to be uh, a presence in the Western Pacific. So Langley is sent to Manila with his airplanes to keep uh, tabs on the Japanese movements in the Western Pacific. And Langley is in Manila on December 8th. Langley's able to escape Manila and is eventually going to wind up in Australia. And, uh, the, the, you know, there is a request to uh, have air, Army airplanes uh, carry into Java for the defense of Java. So it, 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 was, it was kind of political. The government in exile uh, you know, wanted to keep, the Dutch government in exile wanted to keep Java and Walter the boss. And, uh, you know, the, the U.S. command uh, yielded and said, okay, we'll send a lot uh, Langley. And Langley is parked by Japanese aircraft. Uh, south, south of Java, and uh, eventually we had to uh, finish it off. And here's a torpedo from I think see the Hensel Wimble that's uh, going to take Langley out in the late uh, February 1940, uh, uh, yeah, February 25th, 1942, and um, you know that's where she, uh, she arrives today. So anyway. So some folks have gone to Amazon saying, "Oh, they could buy this book at Amazon for some strange reason." Where the America's Air, this book is, there's a, uh, Amazon has a book on how, how to be a, uh, a good petty officer. So, uh, Naval Institute's working with Am Amazon to fix that. But uh, if you want to you know, order the books, certainly go to the Naval Institute Press. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, you get a really good discount on it. And uh, we do have uh, a dinner coming up uh, at the, you know, Press Club, uh, the, uh, you know, the National Maritime Awards Center on April the 18th. I plan to be there. So if you're going to be at the dinner and if you've got a copy of the book, I'll be happy to sign it. Uh, and then, of course, I do want to, uh, one more plug for Witness and Nephew Inferno. Uh, that's at, published by Casemate. If you go to the Casemate website, uh, you can check it out there. And oh, by the way, I just sent another book to the Naval Institute Press this week. Uh, it's James L. Holloway's Destroyers at War. It's, you know, uh, it's a prequel to his book, Aircraft Carriers at War, that was published in uh, 2007. Uh, basically, uh, Holloway left us uh, in 2019, so it's kind of cool that somebody who's been gone for five years is going to be coming out with a book later this year. Uh, but you know, you know, so I, I, I took chapters that were, you know, on the cutting room floor, talking about Holloway's time with destroyers and sipping to a point or two. It, it's uh, it, it's really interesting uh, material, and I think folks are going to enjoy it. So. With that, uh, yeah, I think uh, I answered some folks' questions, um, and uh, let's get let's let's get to it. Let me uh, I need to kind of like stop the share, and there I am. So. All right. So do we have? Um... So thank you, Dave. That was really great. Appreciate your time, and I. I think we answered some of the questions, but did you want to address any of the other ones that, that people had asked beforehand? And if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, feel free to um, put it in the chat at the bottom 
and we'll all be able to see it. Yeah, yeah there's a couple here. I just wanted to note that, uh, uh, you know, the barrier question, it was like uh, before Reeves came out, uh, Langley, I think it was in 1925, uh, was on a uh, exercise in Hawaii, and it was like one airplane missed the, uh, the, the, the landing gear and flew forward into a bunch of aircraft uh, and uh, caused a lot of damage. Uh, I think it was about five, six aircraft. So I think it's, it's that time is when the idea for a barrier came into play. Uh, although I heard, I kind of saw references to it even earlier. Um, as far as uh, training pilots is concerned, uh, they actually had like a mock flight deck uh, they built uh, even before Langley got to uh, uh, San Diego, which uh, simulated a, you know, the size of the flight deck was built up from the ground. So, you know, people, uh, you know, pilots, uh, you know, practiced on this before they were like. So those were some of the questions. We have, oh, Barney, uh, it's got his hand And I'm going to let him ask the question if I yeah. can get it to where there he is. Hi, Dave. Greatly oh. enjoyed your uh, talk. Uh, the thing about uh, Reeves is that uh, he was uh, head of the tactics department at the Naval War College, uh, and that was where the, they did the war gaming. Now, Admiral Bill Sims, when he came back from World War One, you know, the commander of U.S. forces, he came back as an aviation enthusiast, you know, and he was sort of the uh, founder of the gun club. But he he came back an enthusiast of aviation, and he caused he came back gave up two stars to be uh, president of the War College, and he sponsored a series of war games to explore the future of uh, sea based aviation. And uh, Reeves was the uh, uh, wargaming guy. And what they found was that uh, it mattered how many sorties uh, a carrier could pump off if it was going to be used as a weapon. And uh, these reports got uh, fed up to uh, uh, Bill Moffat, who was head of aeronautics at the time. And I, I heard that it was Moffat that uh, had Reeves ordered out to be head of aircraft squadrons in order to find a way to get Langley to uh, be able to uh, operate more sorties, which is why Reeves put the pressure on everybody. And I don't know, I, I thought it was after Reeves arrived that they uh, came up with the barrier, but maybe not. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've, I saw references to barriers, but I really didn't, didn't nail it down. So it, it could be... Uh, uh... Could be after his arrival, but they certainly did have this uh, terrible uh, incident in 1925. That kind of the case to me. Whatever barrier they had wasn't working. Uh, well, I, it, yeah, it was the barrier that made the uh, aircraft carrier a viable weapon of war. Yeah. Uh, so it, it its uh, development was critical, and as far as the kind of uh, aircraft missing the wires and hitting the pack. When we uh, transitioned to jet aircraft, uh, there were a number of horrible accidents like that where the jets just kind of floated over the barrier and into the pack. Yeah, no, and this is this is where the angle flight deck becomes you know critical. So right. The uh, yeah, the the one thing about this narrative is there's a lot of key characters like Moffat uh, is one, uh, for example, that. Uh, you know, I, I just kind of, just due to, to you know, time, uh, Moffat is a really important uh, character. And uh, there, there's a book that just came out about Whiting uh, uh, and talks about the fact that uh, Whiting was never going to be flag officer. And it was uh, uh, part of it is because, you know, Moffat was his kind of like the guy who, you know, over, you know helped with his, what we call Sea Daddy. Moffat's going to die, I guess, on the uh, Akron and, April 1933 off the coast of New Jersey. That's, uh, uh, you know, that was kind of tragic, so. All right, thank you, Mr. Rubel. We have a question from uh, Vice Admiral Dirk Dudek. I think I tried to unmute him, but I don't know if I did. Vice Admiral, can you hear me? Mm. Okay, all right. Well, in the meantime, we, oh, here he is. There you go. 
There we go. Now we got it. Hi, Dave. Sorry Dirk about Dirk that. Here. Yeah, you, you addressed it already somewhat, but I'm just, uh, uh, it's it's been fun after we bought our home in Coronado uh, back in 2019, researching uh, a little history. And as a surface guy, I get tied up in all these naval aviators. Um, so uh, Virgil Griffin was the second owner of our home, uh, bought it in 1946 after the uh, individual who built the home, Commander Mort Seligman of USS Lexington fame. And of course, the uh, great book, Stanley's Blunder, he gets involved in all that. But but uh, Seligman was uh, injured as he got off the Lexington when the last three, the captain, uh, Seligman, and then uh, uh, Stanley Johnson were the last three off the ship. And he hurt his back. And uh, our home has the master bedroom on the second floor. So by 1946, he can't go up and down the steps anymore. And I just picture these two guys. They must have known each other, right? And uh, and so Virgil Griffin, who's class of 12, and and uh, Seligman's class of 19 graduated in 18. But the two of them get together and he says, uh, squash, you got, you got to buy this home. I got to move out. You know, <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I guess you have to make it up because you don't know for sure, but you can just picture these early naval aviators all knowing each other really well. So. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Griffin goes on, to, uh, you know, he doesn't uh, make flag. I think they do a World War II. He commands a uh, base down in the Caribbean. So, so, but yeah, uh, it's it's a it's a tight community. Hey, David, I don't know if you can see this question over here from Judith Peterson. What interaction did we have with the Royal Navy in the 1920s when in the Mediterranean the fleet air arm was operating with HMS Eagle and HMS? Sorry, I can't see the rest of it. Argus and successive fleet problems that were de demonstrating torpedo bombers and reconnaissance. Yeah, that's a great question because uh, I, I tell you what, uh, uh, that special relationship uh, with the British, uh, uh, it, it's not there as far as aviation is concerned because there are some in our, our Navy sees these guys as you know, still potential enemies, right? So uh, when uh, any time a, a brick would come, uh, it was like, show them everything but the flight deck, okay? We, we do not want to show the British uh, how we trap. We do not want to, and, and uh, you know, Reeves was especially kind of paranoid about letting the British see anything. Uh, uh, you know, during uh, the, um, uh, there was a tour up the East Coast I mentioned in 1923, they flown to Portland, there's a British cruiser there. The British are, are filming everything, okay? So they're, they're observing what we're doing. Uh, they we do not like it, and uh, there is a there, there's a couple of movies that were uh, produced. There's another interesting character uh, who is an air uh, you know, air squadron uh, DF two. Uh, I was the commander. Uh, was a fellow by name of Spig Weed, uh, and Spig uh, unfortunately uh, it, it's it, he's at home in San Diego and he hears somebody downstairs. He falls down the stairs. It's partially paralyzed. So he goes on to become a screenwriter for Hollywood. A lot of the uh, uh, movies he screenwrites for are, are stories about aircraft carriers. And so they do a lot of the filming on board the Langley. Uh, you know, talked about that in the book. And the problem when the movies first came out, uh, they you see the actually flight deck operations, the landing gear, and the Navy just, you know, oh my goodness, we're going to, uh, so if you see, you see the movies, the bottoms of the, the, the screen are kind of blacked out to kind of, you know, hide the, you know, the trapping wire. So it's a, uh, uh, yeah, we, we were, we were not, we weren't sure, we weren't sharing anything with the British in the 1920s and 30s. Good question. Okay. Um, before we get to the end of um, the questions, uh, Jack Satterfield wanted to say something, but I was going to go back up here. Um, someone had a question, Edward Maroldo, about uh, wanted you to elaborate on Langley's connection to the Washington Navy Yard, the site of lots of early naval aviation activity. Yeah, the Washington Navy Yard. Uh, well, first of all, Langley came up. Uh, yeah, it was this past uh, uh, past June uh, would have been the centennial for the uh, 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 
the Shriners Parade, okay, um, you know, Moffitt, uh, you know, there was a concern about the future of naval aviation. Uh, uh, you had this guy, Billy Mitchell, in the Army, who was kind of like, hey, we need to have our U.S. Air Force consolidate, uh, you know, naval and Army aviation. And Moffitt uh, was, you know, wanted to promote, uh, you know, carry aviation. So why not bring the Langley to Washington to do flight demonstrations during the middle of the Shriners Parade, which was a really big thing. And the Shriner in chief was Warren Chief Harding. So, um, you know, Langley comes up and spends a week and it, 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 it's a hit. And because of it, Langley has to go up and do uh, similar things in New York, Boston, and Portland. In Newport, uh, but also at the Washington Navy Yard, uh, you know, and they had the uh, first wind tunnel. A lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of aerodynamics was done done there. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, you know, they, they had uh, I think like a sim simulated uh, catapult down. You know, they they did some cat shots there. Uh, the uh, Naval Air Station Anacostia was the uh, first like test uh, facility. You know, they, they did a lot of flight testing out of Anacostia. Eventually, uh, that moves down to Pack River. That's where the uh, Navy's uh, aviation test facility is today. Originally, Pack River was uh, across the way to Anacostia. So, yeah, a lot of uh, naval aviation history in the D.C. Good question. Great. Um, and real quick, um, Jeff, you had a final question about the... Um... Well, here's one. How vital are carriers now to accomplish, accomplishing the task of the U.S. Navy? Yeah, that's a, you know, I would say uh, definitely uh, you see aircraft carriers, uh, you know, playing all, continuing to play all sorts of missions. Uh, today, you see aircraft carriers are engaged in the Red Sea with, with the Houthis. Uh, it, it, as far as uh, you know, it, it, it relief missions. Okay, um, you know, we we see the situation in Haiti. Last time we had a situation, uh, uh, I think it was like two decades ago. You, you had an aircraft carrier go in and uh, you know put helicopters into into an operation, uh, you know, to restore order. So. Humanitarian relief missions, nothing really beats an aircraft carrier as far as uh, the amount of capacity to uh, you know move the relief supplies ashore. You know, there's you know hospital facilities on board. So when you had that uh, tsunami, for example, a decade ago in Indonesia, uh, ha having an aircraft carrier was a lifesaver. Same thing in Japan. Uh, you know, when they had the uh, earthquake and uh, I guess this is about five years ago now, the Reagan. Was, uh, uh, a key uh, as far as, you know, providing relief. And then, you know, the ability, uh, we talked about Enterprise. Uh, when the uh, World Trade Center was uh, hit, uh, Enterprise was heading uh, out of the Arabian Sea, turns around, and, uh, you know, they're able to start conducting strikes against uh, Afghanistan, which is, you know, a thousand miles uh, in the interior. So it, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a capability as, as far as power projected. So, uh, yeah, I see carriers uh, of, of playing a uh, a mission now with, with drones and uh, you know uh, other tools in our kit. I think it's it, it, there's going to be a diversity of uh, systems that we can employ against a you know, potential foe. So yeah, but yeah, for now we're still building them. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to unmute um, Mr. Satterfield quickly to ask a final question. I think we have time for one more here. Hi, Dave, um, and everyone else. I uh, joined uh, on the computer late. I was listening to this on my iPhone as I was driving home from class, and I, I just wanted to endorse the book. Dave kindly allowed me to review it for the Tuesday Tidings newsletter, and also, I think, possibly for Sea History, although I'm not sure that's up uh, to him uh, entirely at any rate. I wanted to tell you it is a pleasure to read. It is just jammed with details that take you right there. 
Uh, one of the important aspects of the story I found is that uh, the, the the participants whom Dave described so well um, were people who had no idea what was coming. <laughs> they were they were living the moment, and for them, aviation would be like going on a rocket ride for us, I suppose, uh, um, coming to grips with the technologies and inventing some of them so that they could make uh, make uh, carrier aviation viable. And I think it's important to remember that, how challenging and risky uh, what they were doing was. And uh, they had absolutely no idea at the time if they were going to succeed or not. Uh, it's it's like the founders of the country writing the Declaration of Independence or and the Constitution, not knowing what the outcome would be. And I think we need to take that into account when we hear the story. And Dave captured the captured the uh, the uh, the times. I thought extraordinarily well. So it's entirely worth your while. Get it and go see him and get him to inscribe it for you. I agree. Hey. Appreciate that, Jack. And anytime I give a lecture in the future, I'll have to bring you in to give the final question. Thanks very much. That was very kind of you.